This video is brought to you by John Robson Guitar Tuition. If you enjoy the content, please consider supporting the channel by enrolling on a course, purchasing some guitar lessons or a t-shirt, or you can join my Patreon. Now, on with the show. Hello chaps, welcome once again to John Robson Guitar Tuition. As always, I do hope you're well. It's Tuesday, or it will be when you're watching this, so it's a top five list, and... Um, I'm joined today, let's put him up on screen, by uh, my old mucker, Steve Hoggart. Bass player, session musician, studio owner, co college lecturer, and many other things besides. And basically, we're going to talk today about, um, well, basically the, uh, the most in influential and important um, guitarists, stroke, bass players. Let's let's call it the most important electric stringed instrument <laughs> players um, in the history of electric stringed instruments. Um, I've got some notes here. My my list isn't properly final yet. It'll yeah. probably evolve as we go along. Uh, so I'll I'll chuck it over to Steve if you want to kind of kick us off, mate. Um, I don't know because I come from both backgrounds of the techie side of stuff and the and the playing kind ofness it would have been mr les paul um because a lot of people don't understand the big deal that multi-track recording yep. did when it kicked off um i mean in the 50s as well it's like nobody else was going anywhere near it and the, the lovely people at ampex um helped him realize his dream because he was doing this sound on sound recording thing recording over the top of stuff um but the big deal with this multi-track recorder, there's already a couple, I think there were three track recorders out. You had eight tracks and you could record on them independently, mm -hmm. which was like a GI huge thing. Um, and yeah, I, I've got to be dead honest. I'm not very keen on Les Pauls. Um, I know there's one hung in the background, but I can't get him to sit on me. I don't know whether it's me kite. Um, getting in the way or I don't mind standing up and playing them, but I'm just too lazy to stand up and play them. Now. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm getting that way now. It's, um, it's like Good I sit down to do something else as well, but we won't talk about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pee all over the floor if I don't. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, I'm with you on Les Paul because, you know, it was, spoiler alert, he's on my list as well. We'll get to him, um, in, in a sec, but, um, he, as you say, multi-track recording and the Les Paul guitar. And um, it's interesting. Did you know that Leo Fender approached him and said, um, yeah. um, I'm building one of these solid bodies electric guitars. Do you fancy uh, chucking your hat in with me? Mm. But I mean, very, it's one of those big what ifs, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it's, he come up with the uh, original, I can't remember what he called it. He gave it a name, didn't he? It was like the plan card. The, the log. The log. Yeah. Um, and it was basically uh, like a through neck thing with bits stuck on the side. Um, it's quite interesting where it it, it developed from because we'd had a, already had a lot of um, semi hollow body guitars, some with a, a block all the way through them. Ah, I think that'd be interesting to see where he went with that with Fender like. Yeah. Because with the way that Fender worked, uh, obviously, as you know, with Leo, just wanted everything to be really workmanlike. I wonder if it was Leo had his heart set on the ball on neck from the off. Um, I, I wonder if it was a bit of that. You know what I mean? It's, um, I don't know. I um, I mean, I'm a ball on neck fan. When I got me uh, Shuka built, uh, the lovely chap that is John Shuka. I said, I don't know. Have you seen that? Let me quickly go and get you. Go on then. It's a proper funny thing, like. Oh, that's gorgeous! Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's tuned to a. Uh, I see, and I've got these daft gizmos on. Oh, like Scruggs pegs kind of thing. Yeah, the hip shot D tuners are they're well known in the bass area, but that's a ball on. Yep. And it was like, why, you know, John, when he was building it for us. Didn't even question it. And where I'm going with this is the bolt on. I've snapped a few necks over the... Yes. Oops. Um, snapped a few necks over the years. Um, some intentionally, some not intentionally, because I'm a bit of an idiot when I've had a drink and things, but I'm better now that I'm older. Um, but I, I don't know. Do you think... What do you think? What do you think with the... 
uh, what why Leo went with the with the yeah. ball on. I think it was um, just okay. You, you you need a fret dress. You need a you need a refret. Just just throw the old neck away and bolt a new one on. I think that oh, was right, the, yeah, yeah. That was the original yeah. plan. Obviously, people don't do that. Yeah, yeah. But I'm gonna. Interesting. I mean, can I talk? That's 1950s talking about disposable stuff. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Nah, cool. Well, I'm gonna go for my first choice with the man who I think. Uh, if it wasn't for this chap, the electric guitar could easily have become a footnote in the history of the guitar. Um, it could have become like the syntax or, you know, <laughs> something like that, you know. <laughs> I'm talking, of course, about Charlie Christian. Oh, fucking hell. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it was it, it was him getting that gig with Benny Goodman um, in the, the mid to late 30s that, I mean, Benny Goodman was was a rock star of yeah. the day, and you know you couldn't get a more high profile band to be in to promote the, the this newfangled electronic wizardry of of the electric guitar. And it he pretty much, I think, single handedly, outside the realm of Hawaiian music, um, made the electric Spanish guitar, the ES one hundred and fifty. He he brought the elect the idea of an electric guitar into the mainstream, and. Um, you know, the the fact that we're sat here talking about guitars, not saxophones, I think is, you know, probably largely down to uh, Charlie Christian in the Benny Goodman Orchestra. I am planning on doing um, a solo analysis of, uh, of, a, of a Charlie Christian solo on the channel at some point, but because it's jazz, it'll get like 12 views or something, but <laughs> I'm still going to do it. So, yeah, Charlie Christian, he would be... John, uh, yeah? just a, a quick interject there. I'll tell you what might be really nice is, because uh, you're a man of clever cards and things, it might be interesting to do a pull-down of um, the, the jazz thing for people who are a bit frightened of it, you know what I mean? Just because... I'm sure there'll be quite well. There'll be hundreds of tunes where he's just done a two-five-one over it. Yeah, you know. So that that would be well cool. That might. That's just me too, honest. But I do. Um, Food for thought. I yeah. Shall, I shall apply. I shall apply my um, my massive <laughs> brain to that to that question. Yeah. Right. So he's my, there's my first choice. Um, uh, you had Les Paul. I had Charlie Christian. Who are you going for next, mate? Um. If it's me personally, or not the the realistic thingy thang of it, or yeah. the big game changer for me was Jaco Pastorius. With because we talk about as bass players, we talk about bass before and bass after Jaco because he just changed so much. And it wasn't just his bass playing; it was his composition. Um, I'm not going to say songwriting because it was more composition than it was songwriting. Um, and, it, you know, just what what actually changed because of it. Um, and bringing the bass to the fore. I mean, the bass had been around a long while. Um, and I think if, if we're going with the stringed instrument, the list. I, I can't think of any other rock star bass players before him, really. No. No, there were some great bass players before him, you know. I mean, it's like there'll be the the Motown school of thought who'll be wanting to get me young, drawn and quartered, saying, where's James Jamison? Where's Tommy Cogbill? Is it? But yeah, it's all good and well, but I mean, what Jacko did was absolutely revolutionary. I mean, Jamison's great as well. And I, I mean, you know, it's like if I've got a top five, I think I probably only have one other bass player in there. Um, but it, it's what he did with the theory of music, mm -hmm. you know, what he did applying his knowledge of music, you know, not just like hitting hope. When you find out how long it took him to work Donnelly out before he put on the record, you know, and it's like, you, you think people just, you know, oh, well, he must have learned that last week or something. And it's like years and years and years of getting it right. Mm -hmm. um, but you know yourself when you're kicking off and you want to learn something new, and you're pushing yourself, and it's a little bit above your station. Um, the first one I would work on anything out like that was Crazy Train, and it was it was really, really difficult. And I was lucky enough to have a mate who got me to play it in the right place instead of some, like, mental, difficult way to, to play it. But, no, I'll go with our Jacko there. Okay. Yep, yeah, wise choice, I think. Um, 
Now then, um, th- this is where my list starts to get a little bit... Um, because I've, I've I haven't done them in any kind of order other than chronological order, going going back in time and oh, going nice forward. Yeah. Um, and on this uh, number two slot for me, I was torn between a chap called Eldon Shamblin, who yeah, <laughs> that's the response <laughs> most I have people. No idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, Eldon Shamblin. He lived down the bottom of your road. <laughs> <laughs> he lived down the bottom of your road. No, no, he he was the guitar player for Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. All right. And if you're talking about um, origins for rock and roll and rockabilly guitar, that kind of, you know how a, a lot of time rockabilly stuff has a lot of jazz lines and jazz chords yeah, in it? Yeah, definitely, yeah. That's, that's sort of really the origin of that Eldon Shamblin's playing. Uh, he was an early adopter of the Fender Stratocaster, and uh, there's tons of videos of him online, um, you know, on YouTube. And you know, just I think he died in um, eighty in in the eighties, sometime eighty seven, if I'm if I remember correctly. But I'm prepared to be argued with on that. Um, but yeah, just fluent, fluid jazz uh, stylings in a country form, like you know, kind of. Um, diminished runs on Blue Moon of, Co- of Kentucky and, you know, and that, that sort of stuff. Massively influential on players like uh, Scotty Moore and, you know, well, pretty much everybody from there on in, you know, Cliff Gallup, um, you know, and all the way through to someone like Brian Setzer. Um, so he was almost, so I've, managed, I've, I've managed to get him on the list without putting him on the list. Um, but no, I'm going to go for all the reasons you said, Earlier on, I'm going to go for Les Paul as being, you know, as usurping him because of his his influence over the guitar and music industry um, overall, other than just his playing, you know, the multi-track recording, the Gibson Les Paul guitar, etc., etc. There's no way I could not put Les Paul on the list, so that's why he's there. Yeah. Amazing, really, isn't it? When you think what he was doing, I mean, it was like the back end of the thirties when he started doing the sound on sound stuff. Yep. Um, no class. No. Oh, yeah. Nice to hear of a new guitarist as well. I'll give him a check out. Um, not Les Paul. Yeah. Eldon Shamblin. Yeah, class name. Like <laughs> <laughs> I always, always like that. It's a, it's a, it's a good one. Now. Right, um, mate. Number three from you then. Um, Alan Oldsworth. Um, Next, <laughs> um, I think. I mean, I've, I met, I'm lucky enough to have had a pint with the guy. Um, I've seen him, oh god, loads and loads <clears throat> of times live, and his attention to detail, his humbleness, mm-hmm. his pushing of musical boundaries. Even if you don't like the music, I the, struggle with it to be honest. Yeah, well, I mean, I could put your playlist together of stuff to listen to, and you'd be all right with like five songs as an introduction. Um, but it, it's things that he did that a lot of people aren't aware of of the, uh, his relationship with effects manufacturers and things. When he did um, work with Yamaha and did like the DG series of pedals, um, he always used uh, multiple delays. Um, as very short delays, tap delays, to get his chorus sound. So it didn't have a, it give you a nice chorus in sound, um, and it did, but it didn't have any pitch modulation, which is like pretty bonkers, really. It's a little bit like, uh, I remember asking him why he never used uh, SPX90 that has a program on it called Symphonic, and that's the same. It doesn't, doesn't detune it. Uh, the Symphonic thing is... Um, all overloads of 80s stuff. Mm. Come as you are, the bass at the beginning, that chorus on that is a a symphonic. Um, But as far as Big Al goes, it was his constant... (laughs) And it's bonkers. I mean, on one gig, I saw him with the dual or triple rectifiers. And then the next gig, he's got Fender um, Twins. And then I think... What did he have when I saw him at the Duff? I think it was Bogies again. And it's like, it all sounds like him. Yeah, and, you know, and it, that's to have that stamp. Stamp. I think the other thing that's important is um, I, I had uh, a good chat 
with a few people who were super knowledgeable on the music theory side of things and said, yes, he could play anything because he had a great ear anyway. But he, he had his own way of notating things and he never gave the band chord charts. What he would do is anything that he was presenting as a composition, he give them a really good quality demo of the guitar and that was it. Then you come up with your own bits around it kind okay. of thing. I think his because his approach to scales and harmony and everything just is from a different planet compared to like what we it would is think. actually it is I don't know whether you're aware but what he would do is he would make a scale up himself that he liked the sound of and sometimes yep. that scale would go over two octaves and then he would reharmonize that scale into four note uh, yep. voicings then he would work chords out that he could play with the scale yeah um. Um, it's it's because it's because it's so unfamiliar. I think that's the reason I struggle with them. But yeah, I mean, for 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 that one legato technique that he <laughs> that he really you know that that just that one thing in amongst a midst of other things that, that obviously he did that legato technique. I mean, that's that's how I do the twiddly sort of stuff. So indirectly, I suppose I've been influenced by him, but you know, he, you know, Satriani, would you have had Satriani without, uh, Holdsworth? Probably not. I don't know. There's a few, isn't there? You know, it's like, it's like to, to see that. I was, um, the tapping thing is mm-hmm. like, I mean, it's not a to thing, but thinking about things like that. Um, Nicolo Paganini had that written down in his pieces, um, really? for solo guitar. Yeah. Yeah, and artificial harmonics, and harmonics okay. in, his, in his stuff. Played in Stockton as well, you know, Paganini, the Georgian Theatre. Yeah, he had really. A, yeah, I can't remember what they call him. Somebody who gives you loads of money. He was just trying to escape from someone in Italy um, for somebody who was a bit of a philanderer, really. Um, and he'd come to Stockton. He did a gig at the Georgian Theatre in seventeen something or other. <laughs> Well, there you go. Oh, I know my head's full of useless junk. <laughs> All good. No, but uh, that would be Mr. Big Al. Yep. Well, I'm going to move on to my number three. And uh, no question, this bloke had to be on the list. Not, it has to be said, most savoury of characters. Um, but influential as a guitar player, nonetheless. Um, a certain Mr. Charles Edwin Berry. Chuck Berry, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, we could talk about his his um, character flaws um, for you know till the cows come home, but let's not. Um, I mean, who wasn't? If you think of fifties rock and roll guitar, what in me, what comes into your head? You know, um, you know, Johnny B. Good. It's it's as far as I know, it's the. Um, the only piece of guitar music that has been sent into outer space. Um, that's that though, isn't it? Don't you think that's a bit bonkers, really? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, on, the, on the Voyager probe in the 70s, they put a recording of Johnny B. Good on there for... And it's know. on vinyl. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, the most stable, isn't it? But, you know, it's... I learned to play lead guitar from picking apart... Uh, Chuck Berry solos, and I'm sh- well. I know for a fact that so many other people did, yeah. you know. Um, and just that that bluesy major pentatonic, minor pentatonic mixture, and and you know, it's and the, the, the weird thing is that you know, basically all of his solos are largely the same. <laughs> you know, it's sliding yeah, that yeah, yeah. double yeah, stop up. Yeah. Yeah. It's sliding that double stop up on the first two strings that. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's in it, all of his solos, but I think that's probably because it's so accessible and, and doable yeah. and recognisable. That's that's what makes it influential. So yeah, it, Chuck Berry. Uh, he, the, uh, sorry, just uh, um, sorry, cut you off. Um, the major amount of pentatonic. I, that was such a massive thing with the blues up though. You know what I mean? And then into rock and roll. Um, it'd be inter- uh, I wonder why, you know, I wonder, I wonder if it's because, I mean, it, it, you can play it over out, you know what I mean? It sounds good. Is it one of them or is it, uh, um, you know, I've always been curious about that with the, the man of pentatonic, you know. Well, yeah. it's, it's you know, um, it's for me, it's that, you know, you had 
like the, the Celtic, Irish and Scottish settlers crossing mm-hmm. the Atlantic, uh, mm-hmm. taking their folk music with them, which was major pentatonic based. And you had the, yeah, yeah. you know, you had the blues and, you know, the, the two going together would, would blues, obviously a lot of minor pentatonic and, you know, just that, that mixture became, you know, rock and roll, didn't it? Yeah, it's great. You, you mentioned that, that the, the Celtic thing, and I was playing a band with a, a chap called Richard Granger and Ron Angel was quite famous. We were both in the Teesside Fettlers back in the 60s, but proper big deal of a band. Mm-hmm. Um, if you didn't in that folk scene, they were kind of like royalty. And I just remember talking to Ron one night. We were, I can't remember where we were, somewhere in Belgium, I think we were. And uh, I said, oh, that third tune in was absolutely class. That. I said, uh, beauty. He said, uh, Guess when it was written? Uh, so I was like, all right, he's being smart. Yeah, so 1910. He said 1400 and whatever. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, what? What? You know, he said, uh, and he got into all telling us about the wandering minstrel thing. But that was fundamentally a 12 bar. <laughs> Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it wasn't anything highbrow, you know, or I mean, it's not going to be from then because it was all, you know, I remember it being. Um, but it was a melody more than it was um, chordal accompaniment because he played it on the whistle. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, it's it's one of them that will have bit, maybe been an intro or something. I don't know. You'd have to be a musicologist, I think. I've always, you know, it's time I investigated more musicologists and what the studying to find out where some of this stuff comes from, you know. So. I, I can recommend a great book. Find a way. Uh, it's called Big Bangs by Howard Goodall. All right, yeah, watch the series, but I'll, I'll get the book. Right, so Chuck Berry's my number three. Um, I think we're over to you for number four now, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, this is a weird one because it's a bit like the Les Paul. I don't know whether I ha- ha- hold people that I think have had such an, uh, uh, a thing on music as just their technical ability, however... This player's technical ability is absolutely flawless. Um, which, when I saw him live, I was a bit like, there didn't seem to be a lot of spark there. There was some energy, but it was like, you know, it was going to be perfect. It's Steve Vai, but it's because of the other contributions that he's made to setting up his own label that's absolutely artist centered. Mm-hmm. Um, the stuff he did with Zappa, um, not the plane, the transcriptions. You've got when to he was 18, 18 well. you know what I mean? Um, and just getting your head around, you know, two chords which are all over and um, being able to get your head around all the instruments. And then where he's taken things technically with his guitar and developed a guitar that works for him. And then, um, but like I say, I'm not. I'm not a massive, I, I am a fan of Steve Vai. I'm more a fan of him as the man than I am uh, the guitarist Whittler. So in this great guitarist, I'm thinking it's his contributions to, when you hear flexible and flexible leftovers that were recorded on an eight track that he borrowed off Frank Zappa. You know, I mean, God, how come the tape didn't wear out? You know, and you hear the stories of how long he took to put stuff together and then, Embracing the tech, I think it got away from the tech side of things. I think of it really. Um, but, uh, <laughs> no, I know he's the same as Ingve. He, he, he people blow. It's a bit like Marmite with them because of the super whittling and that. But I mean, for the love of God, is like class. You know, what I mean, it's a a real emotional journey. Um, I I use that sometimes in lessons as a. Uh, Guitar geek fact here. I uh, I use that in lessons sometimes as a um, you know a, an illustration of what the Phrygian mode sounds like. But there you go. Mm. Um, yeah, apparently he's got. Um, I was listening to um, Pete Thorne's live stream last night, and uh, I was watching it rather. And uh, Pete was basically talking about the new Vi album, and he says he's he's a much more mellow these days. He's he's kind of going more for a kind of almost be doing what Jeff Beck did and get getting away from the kind of twiddly technical stuff and, and just focusing on creating a perfect melody. Yeah. So I should um, have to check it out. Have you ever listened to a podcast called Guitar Wank? No. Um, oh, it's class. It's um, 
Bruce Foreman and um, oh, what they call him, Scott Henderson. Right. And they've got an Aussie guy, and they've just they've got a series at the moment. You know, our our Dumbles just passed away, mm -hmm. and they've got people who were friends with Dumble and the Dumble amp and all that. And it's, I always find it a bit weird. I mean, I've I've been lucky enough to play through a few Dumbles, um, and yes, they are monstrous, but they're not twelve grand. Yeah, monstrous. So I think that's where it becomes the reality of, you know, that. Um, I'll talk to the kids about it, you know, my little thrown together telecaster uh, to move the next notch up. You're going to have to spend six, seven hundred quid to get a, a guitar the next notch up from it. I've put Seymour Duncan's in and it's great and all that, but that, that's, it's a hark back to Steve Vai. Same as Van Halen were modifying instruments to be able to realise their voice. I mean, it's when, not daft things like the monkey grip, I quite like that, but where he's routed out behind the trem, I mean, even our Guthrie's got is um, that thing done on yeah. his, and I was going to, um, I've just had my main stratol titivated up by a, a local guy. What a class load the area is as well. Um, Do you want to give him a name check? Uh, yeah, it's James at Agri-Jag Agri Guitars. Mm -hmm. Um uh i've got it's you like this this is a bit of a local so um john's aware of a chap called jim cairns i've had loads and loads of stuff built by jim jim was as much an engineer as he was a craftsman in the respect that um none of his guitars will have fell apart you know this was like totally over engineered um and i had a a short scale piccolo but a medium scale piccolo bass built by him and I've been wanting to, um, I don't play it too much because it's one of them that um, it really works as a piccolo. Um, and where the story's going, it's going over to James later on to get all the frets whipped out because I've been looking for a, a fretless because I don't have a fretless in my collection. I've got a project in that needs a fretless. I never play the piccolo. And the idea was like, oh, I'll just whip them out. And I think it's harken back to, especially the 80s, was alive with people modifying guitars and things. But yes, Mr. Agrajag, uh, he's doing quite well. He builds them as well. They're very good. He, he's a bit of a metalhead, um, but he, he knows what he's doing with the old guitars and things. Um, he did a tremendous job on me, me strat. I had a, um, I've got one of, one of them Daft Boutique pickup things in it now, uh, which was in like my main metal guitar, one of them bare knuckle aftermath. Um, the touch sensitivity on its class. Anyway, there endeth the geek out. And, <laughs> but uh, I think with our Steve, it was nice to see a long-term relationship with the guitar manufacturer that has been a long-term mm -hmm. relationship. I mean, um, you look at some players and the swap between uh, companies making them guitars as you go along, and it's like, you know, what are you... Do you actually know what you want? I mean, that was tell, one of the tell you what winds me up though is is when you see, um, you know, you back in the days when I used to buy guitar magazines, you'd see the full page ad for Mr. Superstar Rockstar Guitar Player with his latest signature model by this company or that company, and you know, buy this kids, fantastic. And then you'd go to a gig and he'd use it for one song and the rest of the time he's using yeah. like, a, you know, yeah. Les Pauls and Strats and everything. He picks his, his signature model up for like one tune, you know. Yeah. it's. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, so anyway. yeah, it's, it's a cool point that. Um, it's like, I mean, when I got me, me Shuka, built, I'm lucky enough to be an endorsee. Why, I do not know, but there we go. Um, it was for doing all like mad, crazy bonkers stuff on it. And it, it's just come back around again. Now I think I've probably had the bass for about 14 years. Um, but I love it. And it, it's so clear. But it, it's, I couldn't take it out and gig it because it's a five string. I mean, I did with Drift, um, but that was a different kind of thing. Anyway, you're next. My next one. Well, again, this is another one where I ummed and ahed and... Um couldn't quite make me mind up and to be honest i still can't on the one hand you've got um a player who when he was 19 years old plugged i think it was a 1960 les paul 
into a Marshall valve combo and changed the world and created mm-hmm. a sound that I think you know who I'm talking about, a certain album with the Blues Breakers, mm-hmm. uh, Mr. Clapton. Um, you know, but Eric, even in his own autobiography that I read from cover to cover a couple of times, has said that for large parts of his career, he was on autopilot, he was paying the mortgage, he was partying. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, so does one album really get him there? Well, in the end, much as I'm a, a fan of Clapton, I'm making the decision as I'm talking now, I'm more of a fan of Clapton than I am of the, of the chap I'm going to put on the list, actually, Jimmy Page. Yeah. Because, you know... I blow hot and cold with a pair of them, you know. You what? I blow hot and cold with a pair of them. Yeah. I've never really thought Clap- Clapton... I think what he added to the the Beano album was a youthful... Yeah. Like, don't know any better, this is what I'm doing, and they all just, like, put up with him, with the being like, super-duper, dead loud and all that palaver. Mm. Um, uh... And apparently John Mayle would say that some gigs he would turn up and he would just basically strum cowboy chords the whole gig. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I'm going to go with Jimmy Page because yeah. of um, of a knock-on effect that he had. When he was, you know, when he would do that um, kind of open string, double pull-off kind of thing, uh, that caught the attention of a, of a young chap from America. Um and Mr. Van Halen, and that was basically according according to Eddie. You know, I mean, yeah. Robert Fripp was finger tapping before Van Halen. Plenty of players were, as you say, it's a flamenco technique. Um, but you know, in terms of popular rights, I mean, Steve Hackett. There's another guy who was doing uh, you know kind of the tippity tappity stuff before Van Halen. But in terms of popularizing it and putting it out there and making it in an enormous technique, Van Halen. Um, did that, and Van Halen basically was inspired to do that by Jimmy Page. So without Jimmy Page, I don't think you'd have had Van Halen, and without Van Halen, you would have had yeah. the, uh, the the whole eighties shred guys. Really, yeah. it's weird you talk about that because I've just finished. I've been reading, doing a little bit looking about with Ted Templeman, and it's like um, when uh, one of the things with Eddie was he was a big fan of. Uh, Clapton as well, uh, and but like you say, the Jimmy Page thing was was right for them. But I think um, they it appears Van Halen as a band, their their attitude when people would talk to them about how do you become so so successful, it was like, well, you just get in your garage, you write some songs, you do loads of gigs, and then you'll be famous. And I don't think they appreciated the mix that they actually already had. You know what I mean? Yeah. A, you've got Van Halen. B, you've got Dave Lee Roth, who's just like an amazing front man. Not a great singer, but a great front man. And it passes that energy across on, on record. But I think, mm-hmm. yeah, with them, um, I think it's the amount that um, Page has done. I was listening to a, a podcast a, a week or so ago with Steve Albini um, doing it, and he was saying, Working with Page and Plant, he said, Jimmy Page is without a doubt the most accomplished musical person he's ever worked with. End of. Really? You know, and he said, it's like there was bits where he would hum along and go, the second violins played a wrong note. And then when they went over and they checked the scores, the copyist had put an F instead of an F sharp. And it's like he picked up on it straight away and it was just a tiny little bit. And it's like, I think, it's appreciating that, I mean, the guy was doing pro gigs when he was in his last year of school, you know what I mean? It's like bonkers. Have you seen that uh, black and white clip of him uh, as a, as a schoolboy with his skiffle band? No, I, um, I I had it loaded up at college. I'd gone through it and some kids come in and said, do we need teaching? Can you do it? You know, it's like, <laughs> so I just clicked it off instead of saving it. I keep, um, I don't think it was a YouTube thing either. I think, um, I think I might've been on Vimeo or something or, v- or one of them other ones. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to have a look about it. Uh, other sources of, of stuff just like I do kind of not that I'm knocking YouTube at all it's, a, it's it's cool but it's like you know it's like you do get sick of the same beer after you've drank it for that long you know 
<laughs> well, allegedly. Yeah, so Jimmy Page, I think, is going to be my number four. Um, the, 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 the influencing of Van Halen and, and, you know, all the other things like bringing, you know, get, getting the world out of, you know, the, the, the kind of EADGBE tuning for a lot mm-hmm. of stuff, you know, bringing in these old alternate tunings, um, you know, and just, I mean, yeah, Zeppelin. <laughs> there was another band who were a bit like the Stones, ripped off loads of old blues artists and that, um, and didn't. I don't know whether it was a bit of naivety. Um, that's a wrong word, but uh, the the not well, maybe it's right, but not not really knowing that there should be um, credit and where some of the songs come from. Um, but then, is it, are they just lost up in that rock and roll thing? I, I mean. The other thing that I have a massive thing with with Led Zeppelin is Granty, Peter Grant. I mean, what he did for the music industry in the 70s is ridiculous. You know, it's like when you find out that a band would go on tour um, and they would get a flat fee off the venue, mm-hmm. whether the venue sold out or didn't sell out, and they would change ticket prices. And Granty went, no, I want to know how many people are in. I want a percentage of the door. Um you know, which is where ridiculous amounts of cash come from. But thank you, Mr. Page. Yep. Right. So your last one then, Steve, who are you going with? Absolutely no. Um, uh, as soon as you said influential players, you, uh, mine aren't in any order, uh, same as yours. But if think I had to have an order, I think he would probably be my number one. A lot of people go, oh, good, really? Nile Rogers. Um, I can see that, yeah. Just so much back catalogue, so much, you know what I mean? So many massive hits. It's like whatever he touches turns to gold, he just knows what works. Um, And how messy he is, but like when you look at it and listen to it, and then when you listen to him playing, (laughs) all the notes ring out dead clear, everything's in tune, everything's in time, and it's not really as messy as you think, you know? It's it's relaxed and fluent. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's, you know, you ever tried playing a Nile Rodgers guitar part? Yeah, I know, yeah. yeah. And, he, well, you know, he makes it look and sound so effortless, you know. Well, I, I did um, I did a tune for someone. I do a lot of core writing with people and knocking the songs into shape for them and a bit of production and stuff on them. And this guy had done a song and it just needed a lift at the end. Um I'd written the part and I thought, oh, it'd be nice to do like the get lucky kind of thing. So I would, because if you listen to what's, it's, yes, there's only one guitar part going all the way through get lucky, but when it moves so much, you know, each time it goes round, he's done a reharmonization of the chords. And then when it gets to the, the end verse, when it's getting loads of energy in it, not only has he re the the cards still playing them, they've been revoiced higher up to give the song a lift. You know, it's just like, by all accounts, it was one take. Nice. You know what I mean? It's like, um, but Nathan East as well, you know, it was from Nathan East. He said the thing was one take. I think they all played together. Um, but, you know, did you, where do you start? I mean, I read his... Uh, if you want a good biog to read, his biog, oh my God, it's terrifying. When he was younger, he was like um, brought up in a well to do family, but there was such substance abuse going on in the family that he would, you know, come home from school and just be out full of people nodding out and things. Um, but then I think it's weird with it, with someone like that that's just had one guitar that's followed them all the way through the career and he's just synonymous with the Strat and without the trem and all that. And it's like, it's Back in the 90s, I saw, like, I think it was for the, uh, well, it'll have been in 1994, which shows you that when you're getting old, when that still feels quite recently. Um, yeah, tell me about it. Um, <laughs> it, it was for the 40th anniversary of the Strat. There was a TV documentary called Curves, Contours, and Body Horns. I don't know if you remember it. Mm. Um, it's probably up on YouTube. But yeah, Niall was on that, and um, he was saying he woke up one morning and said, "Thought I want to switch to a Telecaster today." 
<laughs> and he said um, he didn't have a hit record for about five years. And then he was <laughs> he was hired to go and do the, um, what, what was that big Steve Winwood record with Higher Love? Um, oh, right. Yeah, he was hired to do that, and he was just about to go out the door, and he thought, no, I'll take the Strat. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, and and as he said, you know, pretty big record. So it's, it's I think there's a bonkers. A, it's bonkers when you see who he's worked with and turned them into hits. Like you know, yeah. turned failing not that Stevie Winwood's career was failing, um, but some failing careers he's turned them round and added a. But the the artist still sounds like the artist, but the songs have got a little bit more sparkle, a little bit more spice. I think I think I might do a a playlist of. Um, our Niles tunes and have a go getting dug in because I'm trying to learn some more clever cards. Um, I, I, just, I just want simple ways of doing things, you know, it's like, um, I, cause I can hear them and I know what the card is that I want played there, but we're coming from this, you know, thrash punk noisy metal background, you know, you're stuck 90% of the time with power cards because anything more sounds pants. But <laughs> we got over it when we did the hardcore things by, say we were playing, I wanted the song to have a G9, so I would get one guitarist to play like a G power card and the other one to play a D power card and there's like your G had nine, you yep. know what I mean? It's like, it, you're not meant to be doing that in a thrash band really, but, you know, it's all, all entertaining. But no, Mr... Mr. Rogers, especially the, the scares he's had with his health and how he's come through the other side. Mm -hmm. um, quite quite inspiring, really. You know, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, good, uh, good twiddler. Right, well, I'm going to go. It's always hard picking the last one on the list, isn't it? Um, yeah, absolutely, because it was like, I didn't know which ones to flip around to then, because as soon as you mentioned what we were doing, I wrote down the ones that the first five that come <laughs> into my head. And we'll get told off in the comments because we we'll I hope just... so. <laughs> I absolutely hope so. Yeah. Um, How so, do you miss so and so? Yeah. I mean, I, I, it, it is. Tell us who your last one is because I want to just quickly mention who we're going to get told why we didn't mention. Okay. Right. Well, basically, the last slot on the list, I'm thinking. Okay, influential. I'm, that's what I'm thinking of. Not necessarily my favourite guitar players, but the ones who've had the biggest impact. So I thought, well, you know, without Richie Blackmore, you wouldn't have had the whole neoclassical 80s oh, yeah, kind yeah. of thing. And then I'm thinking, well, you know, without how many how many kids did uh, picked up a guitar because of Noel Gallagher or because of Kurt Cobain? Mm. Um, but if we're talking about... I forgot about Kurt. Eh? I forgot about Kurt. Yeah. Yeah. But if we're talking guitar players who caused civilians, non-guitarists, uh, to, <laughs> uh, to to kind of, um, you know, to, to join us, you know. Um, when I got my first tattoo, the tattooist said to me, he said, uh, one more of us, one less of them. So wh whoever, you know, if we're talking about guitarists that caused that sort of transition, then, well, let me quote... Um, uh, an executive at Decca Records, when they heard the demo of an up-and-coming band, they said, "Yeah, we think we think groups with guitars are a thing of the past." And he was That's talking nice, of yeah. he was talking of the Beatles. So, you know, it could be any one of you know John Paul or uh, George in the Bing, in, in the Beatles, but I'm going to go with George because I don't yeah. think he gets enough credit. Um, yeah, nice to give him the credit, like I think. And, you know, in terms of making a generation of kids pick up guitar and generation of adults possibly as well, pick yeah, up yeah. pick up a guitar and and possibly have a career with it, then I don't think you can I don't think it would be remiss not to have a Beatle on the list. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's cool. So, and so the that, one that, I was gonna say though is our Hank. You know yeah. <laughs> um and one of the kids was telling us, um, I don't know whether he got the right gig or whatever, he's went to a uh, Hank Marvin thing, and then um, before the show started, they had um, is it far beneath the far beneath the sun? The English far beyond the sun, far beyond the sun. Uh, that going on, and then it was like, wee, 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 and the Hank just walked on playing it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was like, what? But, uh, no, no, but I really do. 
Yeah, uh, I agree all heartedly with that. I'm late to the Beatles, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. really late. I'm talking the past maybe four years, five years. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've come to them more from how clever the songwriting is. Um, Did you watch that Peter Jackson thing? I've watched the first two hours. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I think I'll probably get that finished off this week. Um, I got a real shock when I was watching it to see how much of the boss of the band McCartney was. Yeah. Um, I always thought, for some reason, I always thought John Lennon was the gaffer. Um, but uh, no, it's it's good. Um, it, uh, the first one was the one where George Harrison has a fit of the scream and abdabs and disappears yeah. off as well. Um, but no, it was, a, it was good. So, was a good so who, part, that, who are we going to get shouted at for not including them? Well, our Hank will be one. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> yeah, Gary Moore. Yeah, uh, I, I could have so easily put him on the list. But oh, he's, easily, yeah. He's my favourite guitarist by, by a country mile, but, you know, the, influential. Yeah, I think he's influenced loads of Brit guitarists. I don't know yeah. what it's like over the overseas. But, I mean, he was one of them that you were talking about earlier when we talk about people having an endorsement with everybody in sundry. I mean, absolutely, Gary Moore was one of them. Yeah. Um, Aldrith was another one, but Aldrith was just wanting somebody to build the instrument that he wanted. And I think the problem that happened with Aldrith was the same as um, uh, you'll know of uh, a local chap who passed away a couple of years ago, Kev Smith. I think Kev was the same. His his ideas were were changing. Um, So his ideal guitar isn't something that they could go back to and get again kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, Who else? Ingray could be one. Well, well, I named I name checked him, but he didn't make it into the into the five. I name checked him in in respect to the uh, Jimmy Page thing. But Van Halen. Yeah, yeah. Well, Van Halen did it for me. That was my main. Thing. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm more coming to the music thing from Motorhead. Um, and I didn't know Lemmy was playing at the bass. I thought he was playing guitar. Um, and it was only when my mates told me that he was playing bass that it was like, oh, well, I need to get a bass then. Um, but in that interim time, I thought I'd invented two-handed tapping. and went around my mates. He went, oh, you try to work out eruption. I went, what? What's eruption? <laughs> Put it on and I was like, he put the full album on anyway, you know, and he was like, no, I'll have a go guitar. And I remember his stepbrother saying, you're a bass player, though. You'll always be a bass player and you'll end up coming back to bass. And it was like, he was dead right, Andy, like, so. But, um, no. Other honourable mentions? I mean, I've I, I mentioned, um, well, you know, Van Halen there and and we had Hank. Who else, who else is going to crop up in the comments? Can you think of anyone? I think Jeff Beck might. Um, Good point. Good point. Yeah. Uh, and then there's the un. I do like that. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, people like Tommy Tedesco who can play anything and read yeah. anything and do out. You know what I mean? Um, guys that we never hear of. I've just discovered a guy called Bruce Foreman a couple of years ago. A bebop player. Mm-hmm. And just oh, great storyteller, great entertainer, and <laughs> technique for days. Um, but it's you know, it's a, I always find the guitar thing interesting. It's like Steve Vai's always been a solo artist, but he has been a sideman um, and pursued his own direction. Where there are some guitarists that I think are band members, and I think the Beatles chaps. I like that. I think their their foil is the rest of the band. You yep. know what I mean? Yep. Um, we got Blackmore in though, didn't we? Yep. Yeah. Name checked him. As, as I Stevie say, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Stevie Ray Vaughan. Now, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't have John Mayer without him, would you? Um, no. You certainly. I wouldn't, wouldn't miss that though. I think he's all right. <laughs> but if I want to listen to Stevie Ray Vaughan, I want to listen to Stevie Ray Vaughan. Now, then you turn around and you go, well, he's Nick Darley's licks off all the Kings, Albert, you know. Yeah, maybe. it's, it's. I but mean, I, I was absolutely so crazy. I was crazy about Stevie Ray Vaughan back in the, in the 80s and, you know, all of the kind of old men in the, in their 30s back then, you know, were, um, were telling me exactly the same. Oh, he's just ripping off Hendrix. He's just ripping off Albert King. 
So I think it depends, you know, what you know who is yeah. um, around doing that kind of thing yeah. when you're of a generation to, to start soaking it up, you know, when, yeah, of, yeah. of that age. But, mm-hmm. um, yes, Stevie was undoubtedly influential. Yeah, um, another jumble player. Yep. Um, I think that will conclude the list right there. Um, let, let's you. let's leave it on a high with Stevie Ray. Thanks for joining us, Steve. It's been a blast. You're welcome, sir. More um, than welcome. Uh, I will just do my outro spiel, and I'll just say thank you to Steve for turning up and uh, having a bit of a natter with us. It's been absolutely fantastic, as always. And I hope you've enjoyed the video, and if you have, please hit the subscribe button and the notification bell if you haven't already done so, and give us both a like while you're at it. Go and check out Steve's channel, 27D Productions. I'll put a link in the description. And uh, don't forget the live stream every Friday, 5 p.m. UK time, where we drink beer and talk about music and guitars and whatever else crops up. I suspect this list will figure quite large um, this Friday <laughs> um, in, the, in the chat there. Well, for now, I'll bid you all a good day and say thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your time. Look after yourselves, folks. Stay well, stay safe, and above all, stay sane. Bye for now. Bye.